Wallach on Law examines criminal cases and criminal justice and asks the question, we are tough on crime, but is that helping? Can we be smarter and make us safer? You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Ian Wallach is a criminal defense attorney and civil rights lawyer in Los Angeles and New York. Whose cases have ranged from defense of the accused to the prosecution of governments in their treatment of convicts. He's a former Los Angeles deputy public defender and a frequent contributor on legal issues to radio and television shows nationwide. You're out of order! You're out of order! The whole trial is out of order! You need a bigger post. This country, our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. This is Wallach on Law. Here's your host, Ian Wallach. Hello, everybody. Thank you, and welcome to this week's edition of Wallach on Law. And we're going to be talking about a pretty severe topic today. We're going to be talking about gun control, and it is a hot issue. It's a hot issue for pretty sad and severe reasons. Uh, Ever since the massacre at Sandy Hook, there's been over 70 school shooting incidents, and these are incidents. These aren't, aren't victims. There's been over 70 since Sandy Hook. There's a lot of guns in this country, and there's a lot of people who have access to guns who should not have access to guns. Yet gun control remains among the most partisan and divisive topics in America. Now, the word gun itself, it doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. But, but guns themselves, that guns might have gotten more people to read the Constitution than, than anything else. Or, or at least the Bill of Rights, or at least one part of the Bill of Rights, or at least a tiny part of that part of the Bill of Rights, but it got people to the Constitution. And, and some people believe that even the tiniest gun gun regulation is simply unlawful and and downright un-American. Now, other people believe that that gun regulation is is long overdue and and its change is is just paramount. And unless we do something, more people will die who simply should not die. Uh, Our our guests today are are very different in both what they do and and in how they perceive uh, the, the, the role that the government should play in the control of, of guns. First, we have Richard Mack, uh, Sheriff Mack, as he's known. He's a Tea Party member. He's a former law enforcement officer. And he's got some very surprising uh, thoughts about the war on drugs and, and changes that need to take place in the world of, of law enforcement. But he's also a steadfast believer in an unregulated right to possess a gun. And, and he believes that gun control legislation itself is unlawful. And we're going to hear what he has to say. And we don't have a mute button here. So uh, uh, we're actually going to you know, let him speak and, and let him vent and, 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 and let him, let him you know, set forth his ideas. And then we're going to speak to uh, California Assembly Member Doss Williams uh, of the 37th District, um, which which is where uh, the, the the massacre at, at, at Santa Barbara took place. He's the co-author of a bill that's moving its way through the legislature now, AB 1014. And what this bill seeks to do, I mean, he's going to tell you this, but what it, it seeks to do is provide a mechanism for, for someone like a, a law enforcement officer or a family member who recognizes that, that a person is unstable to go ask a judge and, and show lots of evidence to the judge, and if the judge decides, they, they can temporarily limit that person's access to guns. Is there common ground? Uh, what is the law? What is the history? And, and does history even matter when innocent people are, are, are dying? Um, things clearly are not okay, but, but can they change? Because I hope so, and I think they need to. And if so, what needs to happen to, to make this safer? Uh, that's what we're going to discuss today on Wallach on Law. So uh, thanks for joining us, and thanks for listening, and let's begin. Okay, today we're going to welcome, uh, as our guest to the show, uh, Sheriff Mack. Now, Sheriff Mack is the former sheriff of Graham County, Arizona. Uh, He's a Tea Party member. Uh, He's exceptionally active in politics, uh, uh, frequently related to issues that are outside uh, of law enforcement, or perhaps not directly related to law enforcement. Uh, Like me, he he has sued uh, presidents of of the United States, uh, uh, in in his case, Democratic presidents, uh, and in my case, it was involved in in the Gitmo litigation. Um, But today, uh, we're going to speak a little bit about uh, about some of the more uh, current issues that we're seeing a lot uh, in the media and and some current trends. We're going to talk about law enforcement training. We're going to talk about accountability. We're going to talk about gun control. We're going to ask him what what he refers to as as the rights of of individuals and and pretty much uh, anything that that, that he wants to talk about uh, as well. So, Sheriff Mack, thank you so much and welcome to the show. Well, that's all right. I appreciate you having me on. I think it's a privilege uh, for anyone to to ask for my opinions, my opinions. My children are still amazed that anybody in the country still wants to hear what I have to say. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I, 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 well, before, 
I do want to find out if your if your uh, positions how they, how they've changed over over the time, especially in, in light of some some recent events. But but for my for my listeners who who who, who aren't familiar with your work, can, can you give them a little bit of your background, um, both in law enforcement and, 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 and politics as well? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, uh, I would say that I just started out as a cop. Uh, I wanted to get in the FBI because that's what my father was. My father retired uh, from the Bureau back in the mid-'70s, and I grew up in the FBI. And uh, so I thought of of my father's five sons, I would be the one to follow in his footsteps. And I tried but um, never got into the FBI. It just didn't work out uh, for one reason or another. Uh, so I stayed in police work uh, for a while after I graduated from college, and and then uh, and that was in Utah. And uh, at one point, though, uh, I was writing a ticket, uh, and I wrote a lot of tickets because mm-hmm. yeah, that's what we were told to do. That's, that's what I thought cops did. You know, I've seen it on TV, and I've seen it everywhere. That's what we do. We write tickets, and, and I became very disenchanted with the numbers game uh, that, that police participate in. And uh, I started, uh, I worked as an undercover narcotics officer. And after that, my views about government really started changing. I said, well, why are we arresting all these good people because they smoke pot? And, and then why do we turn right around and kill 50 times more people with legal drugs, such as alcohol and tobacco? And so I said, so if we're really going to get serious about going after drugs, why don't we stop alcohol and tobacco? But uh, we've legalized those. And, and then I said, well, well if we try that, uh, we tried that uh, couple of times prohibition did not work it made things worse sure and so i really started studying those issues and i and i started studying the drug war and i found out that uh, we're never going to arrest away addiction and that uh, treating people like that who have addiction problems and just putting them in steel boxes and cages is probably not the answer in fact it's not the answer and uh, so i have really changed my view on the drug war i do not support the drug war anymore because the government uh, does not secure our, our own borders, and they allow drugs to come in our bo- at our borders, and then they spend ninety-two billion dollars a year to try to stop that which they should stop at the border. And this war has and been going so, on. I mean, it's been going on, you know, uh, since the beginning of the nineteenth century. It was probably, you know, declared a little stronger under Nixon. But it seems like, you know, if, if this is an, an yeah. actual war on drugs, do you think we are winning it? Oh no, we've lost, <laughs> we've lost miserably. <laughs> I think I think the uh, I think law enforcement community and governments uh, need to get together with uh, the community and churches and schools and and others and and try to work on a program and enforcement uh, that would really have an impact and make things better. But uh, the drug war and the enforcement of the drug war has made things worse. Now, now, and now, now, uh, my understanding, my understanding out here for, from law enforcement, and, and as you know, I'm a, a former public defender, still do a fair amount of indigent criminal defense work and defense work out here. But but there is a pretty big, big yeah. numbers game. And it's also, it seems to be uh, that there's a very anti-drug user culture uh, embedded in the various law enforcement agencies uh, out here. If, if you were to have this epiphany that you did and and sort of realize, hey, maybe this isn't in the general good, didn't that somewhat render you as, as an outcast among your peers? Yeah, it does a little bit, uh, but I'm also part of a group that is just the opposite, and that's LEAP, L-E-A-P, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I've been a member of that. I've been on their Speakers Bureau, and uh, I want to make it very clear. Uh, I do not support drug abuse of any kind, including alcohol and tobacco. I do not support any of those. I don't. Uh, I don't have a problem with medical marijuana, and if people want to use that and make them better and feel better, I know a lot of friends who have used it uh, when they've been on their deathbeds, sure. and it made them feel better, and, and it uh, uh, gave them some relief. And, and it's and it has some no, other benefits as far as has, helping them eat, et cetera, things that that other medicines weren't yeah, exactly. able to. Right. Exactly, it did, and uh, so I don't have any problem with that, and I don't have any problem with somebody. You know, I, I'm losing you a little bit here. Um, uh, Sheriff Mack? Hello. Uh, Sheriff Mack here. You're, you're back now. I just, just just lost you for a little bit. Um, okay, good. All right. But the other thing I need to add to that, mm-hmm. the other thing I discovered in all my studying about what government does that's probably counterproductive, I discovered the oath of office and the Constitution. 
And I was amazed that each and, more, each and every public official swears an oath of allegiance to the United States Constitution and thereby promising to protect the ideals and individual liberties that uh, were supposed to be the foundation of America. And whether you like it or not, uh, let's, let's use the example you already talked about, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, gun control in America is against the law. That's what the Founding Fathers intended. That's what they meant. That's what the Second Amendment does. It, it prohibits gun control in this country. All right, all right, all right. But, but I mean, I, I, I understand. This is a huge deviation, and, I, and I'm, I'm very thankful that you know, you're on here to share your opinion. But when, when you say, okay, we're going to follow the Constitution, we're going to protect you know, an individual's rights, I mean, if you're talking about the, the, the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment, a lot of people will argue, is not as clear as you are asserting that it is. Uh, and, well, and we don't well, have it any definitive authority. Clear. That's the problem. Well, well, That's the problem. Is it take, it'll take five minutes for you to uh, uh, discover the intent of the Founding Fathers and the historical aspect of the significance of the Second Amendment. Well, the Second Amendment, it, 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 first of all, was an, you, you can see that it was an addition to the Constitution. It was not in the original Constitution. I mean, it certainly... That's would right. You, so it's That's not right. going to that be... That makes this stronger. The Bill of Rights was established to make the Constitution stronger. The Founders, when they said, hey, we didn't go far enough, said we have to have a Declaration of Rights that government can never touch. Uh, we well, no, they didn't say clear. government can never touch. They said governor. The yeah, government, they did, no, too. they said that That's they, they exactly said the uh, they said it can be touched, provided that you have you know the, the sufficient amount of Congress that, that says hey this this is no lo- is well, no sure. longer applicable. But but well, I yeah, think sure. the, the biggest argument I that I, I would agree with that. But, but the question Wait, is no argument there. But the question but then is is, is, the un- is is it more important for example than the preamble? But what about the preamble of the Constitution? I mean, the what about it, generalities? The, the preamble is it's a purpose. Exactly the general purpose. The the reason that we are getting here is to assure. Or some basic, Rights, simple. But you cannot com- wait, 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 wait. You cannot compare the Bill of Rights to the preamble. Why not? The preamble is a setting the stage, because you had the founding fathers were against a welfare state, and where it says we're ta- uh, the the we, we the general welfare, the general welfare does not mean we create a welfare state. The founding fathers were against a welfare state, mm-hmm. and so they're not contradicting each other. Their, themselves in that. Uh, I, I think some people could argue that your interpretation the of the welfare. Second Amendment we don't promote is, 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 it odds, is it odds well, with the language in the preamble? Again, and I'm trying to explain what you asked me. Uh, 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 but okay. Do uh, you want me to explain it? Uh, I would like an expl- okay. explanation that I can understand, yes. <laughs> okay, so, so if you look at the preamble and say, oh, well, it's the same as the Bill of Rights, that's just total bull. They, it, they are not the same. And and that proves some problems with uh, the perspective of, of understanding history. So it's it, it's your you it's your position rights, that the preamble. You look at the Bill of Rights, and you look at the Bill of Rights, and you come back and you say, why did the founding fathers do that? Because it did not go far enough, and that's what they were concerned about. And, and Patrick Henry, and spe- specifically, did not like how the Constitution was a little bit too vague. And, and and that was the preamble as part of it, because it was generalities. And they wanted a list of specific rights that government could never touch. Uh, uh, I and agree. Then, yes, you're absolutely correct. There is a way to amend the Constitution. And these were the first ten amendments to the Constitution. And if you want to change the Bill of Rights and if you want to change the Second Amendment, go for it. But in the meantime, it's the law. Well, it the, is the supreme law. It, well, first of, of all, before land. we talk about whether or not it, it's the supreme law, we're, we're, we're talking about some antiquated words written 250 years ago. Uh, a certain group of people, oh, so including... It apply today, no, so we don't have to obey. No, we're just we trying to understand to what it means. We don't understand. We're, you you have we an opinion. Lie. You have an opinion of what this of, of what opinion. this right means. Who it's else is it? Uh, who whose else is it? I, I mean, on top it, of a tremendous amount of country. Who wrote it. It's the founding fathers who wrote it. Well, okay, do me a favor. Opinion, then you, you can reiterate it. I mean, it, it doesn't simply say but, but, you have a right to bear arms. There and say, as, a, as a lawyer, for you to tell your audience it's okay to o- disobey something because we think it's adequate. I'm saying it's okay to ask what it means. I'm saying it's, 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 it's violative to take no, a section of a right you're, and, you're and use it against a public good. I'm saying point to a single Supreme Court decision that says your exact interpretation is the right one, not it's still unclear. I mean, well, I mean, I, I could ask I, you to quote the Second Amendment right now. Everybody thinks, hey, it just says the right to bear arms. That's not what it says. 
No, I could quote you all 27 words. I do it all the please, time. Please, please do. But for, for you to, for you to ignore the history. His, I'm not ignoring the history. And, and history is, history is, history is essential okay, to. What's the militia? History is understanding. What's the militia? Let, let's, let's what's be, the militia? Let's, let's begin. What's I think the pe- militia? I think right now people are afraid of it. But before you and I are talking about sub, you know, uh, attacking it word by word, because, let's let the audience hear and, what it and, says. And for you to pretend that the Supreme Court is the ultimate word on what freedom is and what liberty is. No, just on what the law true. is. I think I can take that stance very clearly and I can say the Supreme Court okay, is so the when, ultimate law. And so if it's when, not, then you're the, you're the one acting outside. So when, said, so when, so when the Supreme Court said the, that the, and supported um, a separate but equal doctrine, and they allowed uh, uh, black people to be put at the back of the bus, horrible then, decision. Uh, that was appropriate. Horrible, terrible horrible. decision. And and and, and the binding today. law. And the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court wouldn't know the Constitution or principles of liberty, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg already said that we have a horrible Constitution, and we should be following the the Constitution of South Africa. You know, when you have somebody on the Supreme Court who takes an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution and then completely disdains it publicly, and, uh, you know, and of course she's allowed to stay on for life, uh, they are there to do the same thing that cops are supposed to do. They are to do the exact same thing that legislators are supposed to do, and that is uphold, defend, and obey the United States Constitution. Well, they're supposed they to, right, and they that. also recognize they it as a moving document. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't see anything in a Constitution that talks about corporate politics. interests. I don't, I don't see anything in our Constitution that says a corporation has a privacy right or a corporation no, but, has a First uh, Amendment right. No, but it allows... So, I mean, I, mean, I mean, you can attack Sandra Day O'Connor for inventing a privacy right, and you can attack Justice Scalia for extending that privacy right to constitutions, my, I mean, to corporations. You know, th- those words aren't there. You know, these this, this is the, the the these are our present Supreme Court justices interpreting what those laws mean in light of the current well, of, of about, the current how, facts. How about the Supreme Court? How about the Supreme Court decision that I did? If you want to discuss you your, your Supreme Court decision, no. <laughs> look, uh, sure. as um, every time I go I into court, in my my, name, but, I have a problem unless in le- nobody, getting any judge to follow. Follows. Okay, who's supposed to enforce Supreme Court decisions? Uh, every lower ev- every lower court is supposed to enforce the Supreme Court decision. No, no courts have enforcement arms. Sorry, you're wrong. No courts no have court enforcement have arms. An enforcement arm. I'm sorry. They if I walk into if I walk arm. somebody into a courtroom and they're being charged with some meth that was seized uh, at their home and the officer got it by doing a warrantless search in their cell phone and the judge says, "Hey, look, bailiff, lock him up." That person's going inside. Now that's not because the bailiff and just wants to do it. They're doing the it judge? at the direction of the judge. Well. Correct. And the enforcement arm of the court is the police or the executive branch. We are the executors of the law. And well, wait, wait, wait. Are I you the executors of, of, of the court itself? I mean, I do not know of an officer aside from a bailiff who works for a court. Usually That's it's a sheriff that works in connection. Usually they work for different municipalities or, or federal agencies. I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I do not know a court, true, a police officer of the Supreme, Supreme Court, court of, of L.A. Superior Court. does not have an enforcement court. arm. They don't have an enforcement arm, and the executor of the federal government is the president himself, and he is supposed to make sure that the uh, decisions of the Supreme Court are put into practice and put into law. I can honestly tell you, I beat the Clinton administration oh, at the U.S. Supreme Court. I, 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 I understand. Questions. I understand that you've, you've, you've sued the president on, on more than one and occasion. I won. But and, and, and that's and that's fantastic. And, and, and you know what? When I was and working I with won. the Center for Constitutional the Rights, we successfully got we got habeas rights for the individuals. It. We, and, and that was the same problem. That we had. I mean, I mean, people are still at Guantanamo, despite the fact that it, that there has been three cases right now where they said, "Hey, these individuals have a right have a right to some sort of judicial oversight, or they have okay, to be released." There's overall, been three, you're, you're, and it hasn't happened. Overall, the, the problem with America is not that we follow our constitution too strictly, and you're sitting here telling and giving excuses to people why we don't have to. I'm not and telling anybody not to follow constitution. I'm telling people this is what I'm saying. Uh, I'm saying that right now we have a system that is clearly broken. We've had 19 school shootings since the massacre at Sandy Hook. We've had 130. 32 on school since 1990. I'm saying people telling us, hey, just sit back and trust the system because it's working. It isn't. Okay? Every time we have a law enforcement officer that comes into interaction with someone who's mentally ill, we frequently have a death. We have a militarization right now. We have untrained law enforcement officers getting military-grade military, military gra- uh, grade weapons, result, re- resulting in, for example, in the case of Dontre Hamilton, an individual being shot 15 times with 14 bullets because he, after the officer woke him in the baton and he unloaded a semi-automatic weapon. Okay, we have a system that totally is not working that. right now. You've been in law enforcement for 50 years. Tell us how to fix it. Okay. Uh, first of all, 
by more government getting in the way and trying to pretend that they have the answers using the same Hitleric ideals. Fine, other ideas don't work. From, Give us some ideas that actually do. Away from law-abiding citizens. Give us some ideas and, that actually work. Okay. Uh, how about uh, the shooting of Miriam Carey in Washington, D.C.? How come nobody pays any attention to that? How come this woman driving around with her baby gets shot and killed by police when she was not armed, when she had done basically nothing wrong except go down the wrong street? Absolutely and terrible. What confused. can be done to stop that from happening? And, and confused. I mean, and me- so, media attention. We're I getting right back. We're getting media right attention. What you say? I agree with you. Police are not properly trained, and they're certainly not pro- trained in keeping their oath, upholding and defending the supreme law of the land, which they are supposed to do. They're not trained in how to back away and not make a situation worse. But but your question almost seems to ask, no. But you know, I want I want I want I want to applaud that answer for one second. No, but I think society. I think well, my, of course, our, our goal is to how to make a better society. If we can leap to utopia, that's fantastic. But but I mean, right now, let me give you two different examples of uh, of situations here, and you, and you can tell me because I I think we're actually going to end up on the same page. Uh, right, right, right out here, we have we have um, a, a lot of problems that are happening. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. We have twenty one individuals that just been arrested. Six have been found guilty for civil rights violations and obstruction of justice. It's a mess. On the street, it's pretty much a war zone. In the courthouse, every now and then, not every now and then, I would say 20 or 30 percent of these officers treat inmates with such incredible respect that it is admirable to watch. They say good morning to them. They make sure that the, the, the food's available. They are kind to them when they're in the courtrooms. And the level of violent incidents that these sheriffs experience is by far minuscule in, in comparison to those who treat inmates with less respect. That's, that's, yeah. that's I think, has to be the first step in the long run. But, but, but from what I understand, in, in, in the law enforcement culture, to, 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 to treat individuals who are in custody with dignity is, is considered a, a, a no-no. Does that, is, does that seem true? And if so, would you agree that it's mm. foolish? I, I didn't see that uh, in the 20 years I was in law enforcement, but I sure uh, hate it, yeah. and it, sh- it sure happens far too frequently, and the abuse of power by our police happens far too frequently. Uh, I'm going to tell you, let's go back to the very basic of what I was talking about when I changed my life. I was writing all these tickets to people, and it was wrong. I'm telling you, it's wrong. The wholesale distribution of tickets is another form of taxation. Exactly right. Couldn't agree more. Fairness. Fairness in those courts does not exist. (laughs) That is true. That is completely true. And, And all it is is a money game and a way for local agencies to balance their budgets on the back of people who can't afford it. Do you think that same game's been played in the drug war as far as the application of seizure laws? Of course it is. Of course it is. And that's why our prisons are so full in this country, and we arrest more people in this country than any other we, we, country. Right in the now, world. apparently, we just hit one out of every hundred males, uh, which is a, a terrifying, a terrifying number. And I don't think people realize that it's that it's so expensive. I don't think people realize that that things like health care and their quality of living is compromised because we are spending time with these, you know, extended prison sentences, prolonged prison sentences, mass incarcerations, and, and, and lack of, of of any alternative and potentially more intelligent. Uh, uh, and they keep spinning the wheel, and the same people, basically the same 85% of recidivists, and especially when it comes to drug abuse, just keep repeating and repeating and repeating. Let me ask, let me ask you about that, because re- recidivism, and I agree, uh, and, and there seems to be the two... with crime in America. That it's is not exactly done. right. It's recidivist. So if we're going to address and recidivism, and, and we can address it, I, and I think we have like both violent crime and nonviolent crime, or even we can just satirize drug crime and other crime. Re- re- do you believe recidivism would be reduced if we were to combat uh, drug abuse uh, uh, and drug arrests with treatment rather than incarceration? I think that's definitely uh, one of the alternatives we need to look stronger at. And I know that there's some courts that actually require, um, the, like first or second offense, they require rehab. And so I have to question how we'd have to look at the numbers and see that. But this is what, you know, you asked me for answers. Mm-hmm. And, and I wish I had better solutions for you. But I do know this. We have got to go back to those basic fundamental, fundamental principles that our country was founded upon. But as far as the drug problem, 
uh, we have to get everybody together that I was telling you earlier, all the government agencies, all the schools, all the churches, and get together and come up with something else. And we have to admit, government needs to admit, and I know our pride uh, almost disallows this, we have got to admit that the drug war has been a huge failure, sure. that we haven't done it right, that, uh, that uh, spending $92 billion on a problem that we actually help cause, and that we don't secure our borders, and allow all these drugs to come in, and then say, "Oh, well, we're going to really go after. We're going to have zero tolerance after it exactly. gets there." Exactly, it doesn't make it you doesn't know, make any sense. Absolutely absurd. And, and it's an easy stat builder, and it's it's it also seems to be a, a, a way to to disenfranchise, uh, you know, so many members of of, of you know so many mem- so many members of a community that may not have had access to the same quality of education, to the same quality of housing, to the same basic minimal resources that helped some of us succeed. And, and let me tell you, our organization, CSPOA, Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, we train in patriotism. We train in the Constitution. We train in nonviolence. Uh, we train that, uh, w- w- that we put liberty first. Uh, see, Sheriff Mack, I've actually visited. I, vis- I visited your website, and, it, and, and I'm, I'm going from memory here. But it's SheriffMack.com. Is that correct? Or please clarify. Well, that's my personal one. But okay. uh, CSPOA.org is really the one thing. One, that one thing that I found very uh, uh, unexpected and, and, and admirable uh, on your website was the very personal way. And this is your personal website, but was the very p- personal way that you stand by. Uh, officers who have either uh, experienced, you know, uh, physical illness or have undergone um, scrutiny from 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 the from from the federal government. Uh, it's 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 actually incredibly uh, uh, honorable to 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 yeah. watch an officer. Uh, well, well, let, let me put let me put one of the that into perspective. One of our good constitutional sheriffs from Elkhart County, Indiana, Brad Rogers has an Amish farmer in his community that was being attacked and harassed and harangued and spot inspected by the FDA. Some people think that's great. I don't. I don't like it, and I don't, uh, I, that federal agencies come in and run our farms and personal lives and families, blah, blah, blah. I don't like any of it. Sure. However, let's, let's just take the story. The, uh, the Amish are very passive, and the federal government said, we're coming in to inspect your property right now. He says, okay. So they come in, everything's fine. Then they come back and they do it again. Then they come back and do it again and they take his milk off to a lab and they test it. Well, the Amish don't pasteurize their products. Sure. Okay, it's raw milk, it's raw cheese, raw butter. And I've used these products and I've used them a lot. And a lot of people great. swear by them. Yeah, a lot of people believe they're oh, infinitely absolutely. more healthy. They're healthier. They're healthier for you, period. And so finally, the Amish farmer got tired of it and the without any probable cause, they were taking him before a grand jury in Detroit, about 350 miles away. He didn't have any way to get there, and he's tired of this, and he calls the sheriff, and he says, I haven't done anything wrong, and the FDA just keeps attacking me. Uh, I've passed all their inspections, but he didn't have to allow them to do any of the inspections. No, 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 I mean, this sounds like the beginning okay, of Waco, what, Texas. That's the main this point. Is, yeah. That's the main point. He did, but he did. And uh, so Brad Rogers contacts the FDA and says, look, if you don't have probable cause, if you don't have a duly signed warrants and you don't have due process, then if you come back into my county to do that, I will consider arresting you for trespassing. Now, he made that threat against the FDA. The FDA didn't like it, and they threatened to arrest Rogers. And then Rogers contacts me. He's had my training. He's a great guy, and we sure. prepared a response to the FDA. We sent it off, and bottom line is the FDA completely backed off. They sent the Amish farmer a letter saying everything had been dropped, and and basically, they didn't apologize, but it was no, and that's a, that's a, that's a that's a huge win. I mean, that that it is a win. That's a, and, that's and a so huge win. Now, I want to ask your citizens. I want to ask our uh, citizens. Our citizens. We share them, <laughs> and, and, and our non-citizen <laughs> listeners. But but I want to ask your listeners, which kind of sheriff do you want in your county and in your community? Do you want a sheriff who is a check and balance? on the federal government coming in and doing these types of things to anybody. I don't care if it's the IRS, the EPA, or anyone else. Do you want a sheriff with the guts to stand and, and put himself in the way as a buffer for that kind of abuse? Or do you want the sheriffs like Sheriff Gillespie in, in Clark County during the Bundy siege, or do you want that sheriff? Who I, says, f- I don't have the authority to interfere. I, I fully get. No, I fully get, and I I fully get your position, and I, f- I have tons of respect for right? states' rights in states 
that have managed to successfully uh, regulate themselves and protect and protect human rights. But you know, I'm out here in LA uh, right now. Um, it, it looks like you know our, our sheriff, our former sheriff Spaka and Tanaka, are ultimately probably going to be indicted. The reason they're going to be indicted yeah, is, is for I two know reasons. Baca. And, and, and I know Baca. And, and and what what happened, as, as you may know, was the hiding of an FBI informant, uh, and they changed his name of the computer, and it ended up being a, a obstruction of justice. But what really happened, it was, what was so much more frightening, is that the the Twin Towers facility has become a situation that is so decrepit uh, that has actually increased uh, rather than decreased a, a risk of suicides, and such that the Department of Justice has stated, all right, just staying there is an Eighth Amendment violation, and we in LA weren't able to regulate it on ourselves. We weren't able to fix it on ourselves. We weren't able to stand by the rights of this community because potentially we didn't care about them because they were inmates. It took the federal government coming into L.A. to say, hey, look, this is inexcusable. Otherwise, the only other avenue to make things better were going to be civil lawyers, lawyers by myself, who were going to take taxpayer money and make and incentivize providing bare minimum quality, you know, quality standards for well, these individuals. And, and, and what do we do in that not... situation? I'm glad. I'm glad they did it, and I hope that every agency, federal, state and local is aimed at protecting citizens' rights. I hope everybody does it. But the state should have interfered with that, and they didn't, so the feds did. I, I, I can't agree with you more, how, and I, I think that... Uh, and, it just and, shows how, how corrupt the, the system can get, and I do believe that uh, L.A. is too big. And they need sure. to divide that. They need to make some uh, more counties there, and in Arizona, they need to do the same thing. There's only 15 counties in Arizona. Maricopa County is way too big. It's the fifth largest uh, city in America, or Phoenix is, and Maricopa County is like one of the top, the, the largest uh, sheriff's office. They're too big to handle, just like the federal government is too big to handle. Barack Obama can't manage those millions of employees. It's impossible. It's too big. It's too monstrous. And when you get those things that big, uh, these things can happen. Baca, though, he went along with this corruption. Uh, he didn't stand. We have got to have leaders in law enforcement who we can trust, who are true leaders, uh, who police their own agencies. And uh, I do not support, though, however, that the FBI uh, supposedly is the uh, police of all uh, local corruption. I would, I would uh, join you on that. They, and, I, and, I, and I'm they, surprised, they I gotta say, having you, uh, ha, you know, having you on my show and having read about you, it's, it, it has been such, it's, it's actually been such a pleasure. And, and, and I hope we can continue this dialogue in the future. Got about a minute uh-huh. left. Um, uh, first, you know, I mean, I, I, I know your website is, uh, is, is www.sheriffmac.com, and I do really admire uh, the, 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 the way that you stand by you, you, your fellow law enforcement officers on that site. Would you tell our listeners again about your personal website if they want to read more about the work that you're doing? I mean, your, your other website, not the Sheriff Mac. The other website is CSPOA. And C- if, oh, sorry. Constitutional Sheriff's Peace Officers Association. Oh. CSPOA. CISPOA. Perfect. And if you were to give um, my listeners, all listeners, pretty much a soundbite as to what we can do to make us safer now, what we can do to make us safer in the world of law enforcement, what advice uh, would you give? Get a relationship with your local police, work with them in protecting the community, and I totally believe what Sheriff Clark in Milwaukee has done. He was our CSPOA Sheriff of the Year last year, and find out what he has done to make his community safer, and Detroit Chief of Police. They're both mentioned in my recent book, and get that book, Are You a David? Now, there's there's a big split, of course, between the sheriffs in Milwaukee and and, and, and Chief Flynn. There's there's definitely diff uh, of, of the Milwaukee Police Department. There's definitely a split in mentality, but... Yep, I write about that in my book. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 will, I, will, I will read it, because I'm, I'm uh, uh, sadly intricately involved in the Dontre Hamilton matter. It's only, but, it's only available at CSPOA.org. Okay, uh, Sheriff Mack, hey, listen... Um, I did not expect this to be as pleasurable as it absolutely was. Uh, <laughs> um, please, you know, come back w- you. whenever you wish, and uh, and thanks oh, so yeah. much for sharing your time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Now, one thing that people who who steadfastly believe in gun rights don't like to discuss is what can happen when people who shouldn't have access to guns uh, get them. And on May 23rd of 2014, 22-year-old Elliot Roger uh, stabbed three people to death, including two roommates and then fatally shot three others and wounded 13 others in a killing spree throughout the town of uh, of UC Santa Barbara before taking his own life. 
Now, despite these types of incidents, some people still believe that gun laws uh, shouldn't change or the lack of gun laws shouldn't change. They have these ideas that guns should only be taken away from someone's, you know, cold, dead hands or um, w whatever sayings embody their ideas. But there's other people out there who are trying to make change. They're trying to impose some simple, life-saving measures on who has easy access to weapons that can so easily uh, take a human life. And one of those people is Assemblyperson Doss Williams. Now, California Assemblymember Doss Williams, along with California Assemblymember Nancy Skinner and others, in response to what happened uh, at UCSB, ha have authored a bill, and they're now pushing it through. It's AB 1104, and its purpose seems pretty narrow in scope, but, but I'm not going to tell you about it. Uh, thankfully, and, 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 and welcoming to my show, uh, we have with us today uh, Assemblymember Doss Williams. Uh, Mr. Uh, Doss Williams, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. You know, I, I'm glad that you indicated the number of people who were wounded as well. Uh, some people will equate that half of the victims died by knives, that, that, that guns aren't the problem. But there were 70 rounds of ammunition that night expended upon uh, folks, um, and there were was several thousand rounds of ammunition that had yet to be expended. And uh, the perpetrator, Elliot Rogers, had attempted to walk into a sorority, which was the, one of the first and primary targets of his killing spree. Fortunately, they refused to open the door. Uh, if they had, there would have been far more victims, and, um, and, and the tragedy would have been compounded. I, I grew up in this community uh, just a couple blocks away from each one of the crime scenes, and it's something that's hit uh, Santa Barbara and Isla Vista in particular very hard. Um, we were shocked. Um, uh, we were for, full of mourning. We didn't at first uh, immediately go to an idea of legislation. Um, but one of the key facts that emerged in this case was that the parents of the perpetrator had recognized that there were dangers, that he was posing a danger and that they had not had any legal right to intervene. All they could do is tell the police that there might be a problem, and then the police had did a cursory investigation, determined that, that the, really the perpetrator was able to hoodwink them into believing that he was stable. So there was, there was, there was no mechanism for people who were capable of identifying a, a legitimate threat to, to, to do anything about it. And I take it there still Absolutely. really is. I mean, I mean, and that's what our, our bill attempts to do. Uh, you know, I wanted to do a thoughtful, measured response to this tragedy, something that uh, might have uh, prevented it uh, if it had been in place, and to give loved ones, um, who are often the first to recognize signs of someone being suicidal or homicidal, the ability to intervene to save lives. Now, now, how does this bill do that, and, and what does this, does this bill do uh, in, in the state that, it, that, that it's in right now, in the state as it's written right now? Uh, it is similar in structure to how a um, domestic violence or uh, a stalking um, restraining order is obtained, but it establishes what's called a gun violence restraining order. If uh, a loved one or a law, law enforcement personnel, um, uh, you know, sees evidence uh, that they're, this person is posing a threat to themselves or others, um, they can go to a judge and uh, present evidence to that judge. And if the judge deems it the evidence clear and convincing, the judge can grant a gun violence restraining order. Um, uh, he would do so for a limited period of time until there's a chance uh, for the uh, person in possession of the gun. So this so, isn't just a, a blanket, you know, anybody can say, hey, I think so-and-so is in trouble, and in instantly they, 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 they're, they're going to lose their, their capacity to hold a gun. It needs to have judicial oversight. And it, it, it's, it's temporary in nature until I take it there's a hearing and the individual could then challenge the, the restraint at, at that time. Is that, is that a fair summary? That is correct. Okay. That is correct. And, you know, and this system has worked for uh, over a decade now uh, with domestic violence and stalking restraining orders. But let's, let's, let's just be really clear here. 
often it will be a spouse or a parent um, or a child of someone that recognizes that someone is so suicidal that they pose a threat to themselves or is increasingly bitter and wishes to lash out at the world and is in possession of firearms. And I don't know anyone who would be more um, more often the person who will see the, rec- the, the signs. Sure. And, uh, and unless the person uh, is undergoing or, some or type someone who's living with them. And unless the person's undergoing some type of, you know, of treatment, which is, you know, so so rarely the case, the the family or the people closest to them are, are going to be the only people who are going to have that window. That's right. And uh, and we felt that this would be appropriate also to extend to law enforcement personnel. Um, this uh, ability exists in two other states for law enforcement personnel, and we thought that would be uh, good to uh, bring California law into the same kind of unit. And when you say law enforcement, you're not saying that these law enforcement personnel have the right to say to someone, hey, I deem you, I deem you um, unsuitable to carry a gun. You're saying law enforcement personnel can go through the same processes, right? They can go to a judge and say, hey, look, there's a concern. Please evaluate it. And only then can the judge issue some form of restraint. That's right. And you as an attorney, you'll understand that they, it's very important that we have a clear and convincing evidentiary standard. Um, You know, this is not simply um, suspicion of posing a a threat to themselves. And let me just let me just chime in to to, let me let me just chime in really quick to the. This is simply this is clear and convincing. Right, and and just and just so our 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 listeners out there understand, there's a whole bunch of different uh, standards that are available. The law. I'm not going to go through them right now. You know, clearly the the one that people are most familiar with is beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, you got to be outside of you know any thoughts that this is is a bad idea are, are are simply unreasonable. More likely than not, you know, is the preponderance standard. We see that in civil case, clear and convincing. This is you, you need a lot of evidence. I mean, clear and convincing is the, is the standard that people need to to to, depri- to decide to take someone off life support or to take children away. You need a lot of evidence in order to convince a judge to take this action under that standard. And what kind of, and and a lot of people wonder, well, what kind of evidence would that be been in this case? Well, the evidence would have been the YouTube videos he posted um, that essentially threatened to take revenge on um, all young women in particular, uh, uh, but but also all others uh, in the community. Um, And, uh, and Things on on uh, social media uh, and uh, perhaps uh, comments that they had made to uh, the parents themselves. So it doesn't in, seem in like a it's... case like this. There, there, it would be very, it would be possible to reach that evidentiary standard. Um, uh, if some of these things come up, I mean, I mean, it seems to me like this bill is basically dedicated towards setting up a mechanism where people who can, yeah, exactly what you said, people who can really hurt themselves or hurt others. For a period until a hearing, shouldn't have access to weapons. That right. that doesn't and, seem and that I a far fetched idea. Going back to your your a point about some people having a problem and and believe you know people who believe that someone who's mentally unstable should have firearms is just simply never going to agree with my legislation or for, frankly my community. Yeah, and, and I agree I, with I'm that. I tell you that in my community, I know. Uh, gun issues is a very partisan issue in most um, areas, but in my community, it, we have been faced by such a tragedy. It is no longer a partisan issue, and and many gun owners have actually been very appreciative that my response um, uh, has been measured and targeted. Um, every right that we possess as Americans is a qualified right that can sometimes be lost with cause. Right? Our right to free association can be revoked if we commit a crime. Uh, in fact, it can, uh, you know, you, you've heard of um, uh, gang injunctions. Our right to free association can even be revoked just with membership into a criminal enterprise. Sure. Not even with a conviction on the crime. And so, uh, you know, I think Amer- American law is pretty, is pretty clear. We have uh, and enjoy a great suite of rights more than most societies in the world. But that doesn't mean that we can't temporarily lose one 
with cause. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're going a little right further to, even than I would. I mean, I, I, I don't see the word gun anywhere in the Constitution. Uh, people say the right to bear arms. I'm like, look, you don't have the right to, you know, you know, keep a nuclear arm. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not as clear as, as, as uh, on, on what this, the Second Amendment means as some people with voices much louder and brasher than mine uh, 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 appear, appear to have. But, but you're saying that even if we accept that, that it is a right, that let's say, you know, the Constitution provides us, uh, you know, a, a right to, to, uh, to have a gun that then, then that right, like any right, should be subjected to certain reasonable limitations that are necessary for public safety. Yes, and sometimes these would be simply temporary ones. I mean, uh, some people are heavily depressed only for a temporary amount of time. I, I myself experienced the fact that when my uh, father's um, when my when my father's fiance was passing away from cancer, you know, I felt he was. Um, uh, heavily depressed, which is very understandable under the circumstances, but also knew he was in possession of firearms. So I said, "Look, you need you need to hand me your handgun." Um, and and um, sometimes that can be worked out uh, among loving family members, uh, but sometimes uh, that that level of depression or that level of of homicidal anger is so much that it really is more appropriate. Sure. Now, listen, you, you talked, I mean, it doesn't seem like, like what you're asking for is all that unreasonable. Um, uh, but And yet, I imagine it, it hasn't been easy. What type of hurdles uh, have, you, have you faced in trying to get this bill passed, or do you expect to face uh, in, in getting this bill passed? Well, I can tell you, um, we locally in my own community, Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, it's been very popular. But we've definitely been bombarded from outside the area with hostile, angry, and threatening phone calls, uh, emails, and Facebook messages. And nothing is more comforting than a, a hostile, threatening message from someone who is potentially armed. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's... So that's um, and and and, uh, uh, and of course, it, it has not been necessarily easy to get it through the legislature. Uh, it's it's generally been on party line votes. Uh, in California, we do. Do we have, know? Do uh, we know why that is? I mean, is that is there some uh, you know uh, gun manufacturing lobby? Is there some you know movie lobby that profits off violence? I mean, or is it just this this obsession that people have with you know with with guns that 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 are you know since you're a kid you're given you're given a toy gun you're sent to parks with shooting galleries you're given video games why do we have this, this mindset? Why do so many people have this mindset that's that's against a reasonable restraint? I think most of my Republican colleagues are afraid that if they voted for it or other reasonable restrictions, uh, that the NRA would come after them uh, in the next election. Okay, I see that. I see that at a political level, and that makes a, a, a ton of sense. And the NRA can be incredibly dangerous to, to politicians, but. But what is it going to take? I mean, uh, right, I, I would ask myself, like, what's, what's it going to take? Do, what, do guns, what if guns killed more people than, than you know, so American soldiers dies in war? Well, that, that happened, and nothing changed. What if guns start, you know, being used to kill politicians? Happened for centuries, nothing changed. What if guns are starting to be using in schools? We've had 200 since, since 1990, around 200. And then what about young children in schools? I mean, have... We have Sandy Hook, and, and we think, all right, Sandy Hook, this has got to be it. Like, this has got to – people have got to wake up now. Nothing. 74 – one every five weeks, 74 school shootings since Sandy Hook. I mean, do people need to be in your situation, like like live near people who get killed or have somebody in their family killed to realize that, that, that maybe we need to have some form of restraint? I, I think that's the question. Uh, you know, this week we had the families of the victims – up in Sacramento, helping me try to pass the bill, and um, and that is really the the question that they asked loud and clear is how many people have to die before we're willing to uh, make some reasonable changes to our society. Uh, you know, eighty six people die a day from gun violence. In eighty six a day. Eighty six people a day. It is only exceeded by car accidents and um, uh, poisonings, which are either uh, suicides or people taking the wrong, wrong, uh, uh, wrong drugs. So those are the only causes of death that are higher uh, among Americans uh, than gun violence. And, and I think that that is something we have to look at and say, you know, this is something that we have the power to change. Um, and but, but to do so, um, People are going to have to get as outraged um, as uh, the other side of things. I mean, what, what happens is 
that um, most people who want reasonable restrictions, they want reasonable restrictions, but they're not ready to get outraged about it. And I guess what uh, the gun lobby is outraged at every reasonable innocuous um, uh, restriction. You know, one thing one thing that sort of was, was circulating when, when the Stand Your Ground issue was, was, was being talked about so much in the Zimmerman trial, even though it wasn't, it wasn't directly related, is that there is no heightened duty of care. There's no heightened level of responsibility placed upon someone who instigates a conflict while armed. I mean, it, which it's it, it's mind-boggling to me that two people, if two people are at a bar and one is armed and one isn't, and either one of them choose to, you know, start a fight. They can both; they're both only subjected to the same punishment, technically under the law. Like the, the one person can lose the fight and say, "Hey, wow! Even though I started this fight, I'm losing it." So now, under these laws, I'm I'm potentially uh, entitled to, to to be free from prosecution. We don't put any heightened duty of care or any heightened legal or or punitive responsibility on individuals who are armed, and that's that's. Frightening to me, and, and that and that is, I mean, look, I I, I believe um, that there are a lot of responsible gun owners out there. I believe that the majority of owners of guns are responsible, but that is a, an important phrase, responsibility, and responsibility requires certain things, and in this case, um, that people who are mentally unstable, um, uh, that there is some legal route for them to be temporarily deprived of their weapons. Um, and for some, it would just be simply the, the expiration of time of the gun violence restraining order, which is 23 days, 20 day, 21 days. And um, for some, it could be up to a year. Um, and of course, uh, these uh, restraining orders are renewable if someone has a Permanent condition, and they're endable too, right? I mean, the individual, the, the individual who, who, if someone says, "Hey, listen, someone has said I'm unstable and I have access to a gun. I am stable here. I, I'm allowed, they'd be allowed to get a hearing, show that they're stable, and then have the restriction removed." And and what we've heard from law enforcement is really interesting. They say that there are so many people that they encounter that don't meet the the definition of what's called a fifty one fifty. And just uh, let, me, let me just explain that for my uh, for the listeners that that are that are aren't lawyers or, or involved in law enforcement. Fifty one fifty is when somebody is uh, is is so potentially mentally unstable that they can pose a, a, an immediate harm to themselves. They may or may not have committed a crime, but the state or government agencies are allowed to take to take hold of that person and basically you know keep them in custody for an initial seventy two hour period that can then be extended for two weeks. But the whole idea is, hey, look, we've identified this person as a potential danger. We're going to put a fifty one fifty hold on that individual. So, so, so they don't hurt themselves or they don't hurt the others while they're in this state. And the, the flaw of our law about 5150s is, it, it, it is the only way to do it is a, um, a, a diagnosable mental disorder, and uh, it has to be um, uh, there has to be a psychologist or, or um, uh, uh, psychi- psychi- psych- psych- psychiatrist. That makes that determination. And our states are, and, I mean, and uh, you know what? We don't have enough psychologists. Yeah, we don't. Our, our county budgets are everywhere. long; they're already inc- incredibly dried up. And uh, you know, and, and and the people who do choose to devote their their these licensed professionals who do cho- to, to choose to give this aspect of their, their time to public service or for an incredibly less salary than they make in the private sector are are inundated with with work to do. So we c- can't really expect them to be as thorough or as competent as maybe some people in the private sector are. That's right, and and so many people out there unfortunately do not have access uh, to psychological help, um, and and so there has to be another way. And pretty much the only uh, one that the only routes that we can we can see where this can be addressed is either through law enforcement or through the family members themselves. And I think this will save lives um, uh, from uh, these sort of tragic um, uh, uh, murder sprees. But more, even more of the lives will be um, that of people who are enormously depressed, um, but uh, in, in possession of firearms that temporarily need to be deprived of it. Um, if, or, you, if you don't mind, let me ask you a question about what you spoke of earlier about your, your, your father-in-law. When you said, listen, I need to take your, your firearms, and, and, and he relinquished that, them to you, uh, was that detrimental to your relationship with him? No. 
<laughs> you know, that's why I really encourage people to confront one another um, at, at some level. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we should be a loving society. We should be having have loving families. Of course, there's some people who, um, you know, their level of um, depression or their level of aggression is so much that that wouldn't be a good idea. And, of course, that's that's really the what I would recommend to people, the threshold of that's when you should be going to a judge for a gun violence restraining order. Which right now they can't do. Which right now they can't do, but... But God willing, uh, by January 1st, we'll be, we'll be able to, to do if, if the governor signs our legislation. Now, if the governor signs – now, it doesn't go – I mean, I've, look, I've looked at the bill. It, go, it would – there would still be a one-year lapse, right? I mean, it, click, it would take effect in, in, in 2016, or do we not know yeah. yet? January, January 1st, 2016. And, and what, what is the projected future of, of this bill? I mean, I, I sadly know all of my state politics through, you know, the, the, the commercials that would play in between Sesame Street when I was a kid. So I, I, don't, I don't know <laughs> what the life of this bill would be in California until it would actually turn into law. What, what, what steps need, need to transpire? Well, almost all the steps have gone through. Um, the bill has been heard in um, committees in the Senate. It has passed through the Senate. It is now in the assembly. It will have a bill hearing tomorrow morning, and hopefully it will ha- be to the floor of the assembly uh, tomorrow afternoon or evening. And we, we are up against a very solid deadline. Um, all the bills have to be out of our house by midnight on Sunday. And uh, that um, uh, so we're encouraged. But we're also in overdrive to make sure that we can get this to the governor's desk. Uh, then the governor would have 30 days to decide whether to sign or veto um, the legislation. And if he vetoes it, you're done. And if he signs it, then it comes into law, and then it starts taking effect in January of 2016. That's right. And, you know, our, our governor has not has vetoed some gun legislation. He's also signed some gun legislation. He's been very thoughtful. And so um, we do encourage folks that if they think that um, uh, this is a measured approach, that they should uh, uh, call the governor's office and encourage him to, to sign the bill. Well, yeah, that's – can they, what can they do? They can, go to, they can sign the bill. They can uh, write him a letter. They can go to his website as well, right? Absolutely. Uh, um, we have – fortunately, our government is pretty accessible – uh, they can write the governor an email. Uh, they can uh, write him uh, in the state capitol. Um, and you don't even need to put an address. Just Governor Brown, state capitol, Sacramento, California, and it'll get there. Fantastic. And if, what should these people say to to others who may who may have uh, you know really steadfast Second Amendment views? Is there like a, like a soundbite? Is there something that, that that we can just say to pass along about hey why this is a good thing, not a bad thing? Absolutely. Just that um, you know we're. We're not trying to uh, paint all gun owners with a broad brush. Um, we know that there's a lot of responsible gun owners, and but we simply feel that sometimes people are a threat to themselves or others, and that the high evidentiary standard required in this law will prevent uh, it from being abused in the in the manner that Second Amendment advocates um, uh, sometimes worry about. Well, uh, Assemblymember Williams, um, a couple of things. Uh, uh, and first of all, uh, 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 the, he's actually taking his time from the floor to, to, to help us sort of understand this bill and its importance, and I'm incredibly thankful for you for doing that. It's it's, it's incredibly kind. I, I, as, as, we, as I speak, I am in a uh, phone booth on the side of the floor. <laughs> I didn't know they yeah. still had the those. Still if they, unbelievable. Uh, they oh, my work. God. If they, When the next Superman movie comes out, maybe we're going to see it. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is so. We've been speaking with Assembly uh, Assemblyperson Doss Williams uh, of the 37th District in Cal- California. If you want to read about him, uh, you can go to www.asm.ca.gov uh, front slash Williams. Uh, if you simply Google the bill AB 1104, uh, you, you, you'll be uh, 1014. Oh, 1014. I'm so sorry. So I, it's a little number dyslexia there, but AB 1014. Uh, you'll be able to read it and, it and its text. And and thank you. Thank you for not only for taking the time, but thank you for doing something. I mean, this is a big step. It's a, any step that actually gets done is a huge step in the right direction. And it seems like all you're asking is, hey, listen, let's find a quick, simple way to try to save lives and take people who are capable of hurting themselves or others, stop them from that, because everyone's going to be the better for it. Thank you. That's right. Thank you for what so you're doing. Many of these tragedies could be uh, uh, avoided, 
and so many of these kids would have a chance to grow up with their parents. Well, listen, my heart is with you, and and, uh, and I hope the votes are too. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and explaining uh, what, what you're trying to do, and thanks for doing it. All right, folks, we are out of time, so we got to wrap it up. Check us out at RenovateJustice.com. Contact me at WallachLegal.com. Send me your thoughts to change at RenovateJustice.com. And please, folks, let's, let's keep using our heads. Let's stop using our hate, and let's make change. We can do it. We can pull it off. Thanks so much, and have a great weekend. Oh, yeah.